Hey, Earthquakes fans, welcome to another special edition of the Aftershock. I have a special guest today. I'm so excited to have him on the show for the first time. I've been on his show a couple of times. And uh, Ted Ramey, uh, the host of the Soccer Hour on KNBR and the radio voice of the San Jose Earthquakes. Ted, super excited to have you on. How are things? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. I, uh, I appreciate when the, uh, the great bald minds can get together and solve world problems. So I think, uh, you know, no, I, uh, I'm joking, but uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm happy to come on. And, you know, as I've told you before in person and now, you know, anybody else who's tuning in, the, uh, the work you guys are all doing is, uh, is fantastic. I know that uh, for my drives home after the game, once I finish up my post game stuff, I'm tuning into you guys and uh, y'all are killing it. And, and we love the soccer hour and uh, between the two of us, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, the fans are, fans are getting what they need uh, during their commutes and such. Yeah, right. So let's let's talk a bit about what's going on with the earthquakes, because, I mean, just since we've last talked, everything has feels like it's changed. And, yeah. and before that, everything had changed, too. And, and it's like this team is is constantly changing, you know, up and down. And now, you know, a lot of draws, but a win in Seattle for the first time since 2015. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's get into the run of form in a bit. But first, let's talk about these trade deadline moves. Jeremy Abobasi, a nine slash winger for the Portland Timbers, 24 years old, um, exciting prospect for a while, but maybe just not getting enough time and certainly not getting enough time at the striker position for the Portland Timbers like he would like. Mm -hmm. Um, Traded to the San Jose Earthquakes for a bit over a million in GAM, some accounting you know, stuff going on there between the TAM that they've already charged uh, for him this season, as well as, you know, again, reimbursed GAM next year, puts this closer to 1.167 million in GAM. That is a huge amount of GAM. And it was taken actually from the 22 and 23 seasons. Um, What do you think about this, this move? It's, it's pretty ambitious, given that the team doesn't have a full-time general manager right now. Yeah, I mean, I think the the greater narrative or the sub narrative, I'm not really sure how to um, what sort of definition to ascribe to it. But I think part of it is Chris Leach trying to shoot his shot, right? Like he wants to show that, hey, this is my ability. I can spot this talent. I can make things happen. I have the connections. I have the ability to make these moves happen. And that's a, a stark contrast to what we saw from Jesse Fiorinelli who did not work much within existing players. We saw Dominic or or Duro come over in that trade. Uh, We saw Eric Rometty, and that's about it, unless I'm forgetting somebody off the top of my head, Um, which that was Jesse's prerogative. And just, you know, before I go any further, Jesse, I I loved the guy. He was, you know, the best dude on one-to-one. You know, me and him had a really good relationship. I wish that things had worked out with him because you've said it yourself. You could tell that he really cared deeply about the club. Um, And, you know, I just want to put that out there because I I in no way want my comments to denigrate anything about Jesse because I think the world of him, um, but specifically working within the league was not what he had done in the past. And I think that Chris Leach is trying to show that he can get things done and get them done quickly with the Bobasi, even though he was born in, in France, he's, you know, an American citizen. He represents the United States men's national team. He's had one cap with them. He's been on the some of the U23 and other youth squads. And this is a guy who ostensibly can come in and maybe be on the bench on Sunday against LAFC. I don't, I don't know. I haven't really asked that question specifically. But it is interesting just to watch the the different side of the spectrum. It's it's the it's the opposite of what Jesse Fiorinelli had been doing. So. With the move for Abobasi, I, I mean, you love the speed. He's got size. He's six feet tall, 175 pounds. You maybe use him in the way that you saw them want to use Danny Houston at points when he was healthy, kind of getting those runs over the top. And I think that with him and when Benji Kikanovich gets healthy again, because we saw him, he was almost like a target forward. You have more ideas of who to put up top because Cade Cowell right now at his development he's just trying to muscle through everybody and beat them with his speed not his forte yet so you can put a Boba C up top you know and then you can have Cade 
on the wing and you can have Espinosa on the outside and you can have Wando coming off the bench. You can have Chofis doing his thing. It's, it's exciting. I, I think the move is really, really exciting. It is ambitious as you alluded to, but this is Chris, Chris Leach trying to say, look, I can make moves that are going to help us in the short term and in the long term. Yes. So Ted, you know, definitely a Bovisi seems like a very big swing for Chris Leach. And I want to get back to Chris Leach here in a second, but another move just before the trade deadline last night, longtime veteran of the team, someone that Jesse Fiorinelli had brought in, but, you know, maybe more than any other player who's uh, not from MLS came in really kind of with a love for the badge, a love for the team, put his all on the field every single time, you know, even if it wasn't his best performance all the time. Um, Florian Youngworth, uh, you know, there's a move here that, uh, that uh, to the Vancouver Whitecaps uh, for 200K guaranteed in GAM for 2021 mm -hmm. and the possibility of 100K in GAM for 2022. That kind of seems like a, a lot of GAM. It seems like a pretty decent move given that Flo, I believe, is 32 years old at this point. And so, you know, on the back end of his career, you know, when you heard this news about Flo, like what, what were your immediate impressions? My immediate impressions were it was unfortunate on a personal level because I think Flo is uh, he's a great dude. Uh, you know, you, you hit on the, the passion that he shows out there, the way that he came in and really represented the club. These are exactly the things that you wanted to see. And he had some big moments in 2017 and he had some big moments in 2020 coming up strong. My other reaction beyond the move where I was like, okay, this, you know, let Leach do what he wants to do right now. This is his opportunity. My other reaction was, well, that's interesting because right now you have Eric Rometty and Judson who have, well, Rometty's dealing with an injury. Judson is on one yellow card and then he's suspended. And then I think Rometty is on one or two and then he's suspended. I don't know off the top of my head. But Jackson Yule is back, and Florian Youngworth, as we saw, before he came to the Earthquakes, he played that defensive midfield position. So he had versatility. He could play the, the center back. He could play the six. So right now, you just traded away some depth. But I understand that if you think there's something there, you can get a good return. That, that makes sense. You also have the ability to plug in a Jacob Akinurich, who has looked capable and the one very brief start he made last year before he got injured right. um, i believe he's been dealing with a little bit of a thigh injury but maybe they feel right now that even if they had to go back to a two-man back line if somebody got hurt that they would still be able to do that because we're seeing a lot less of the classic man marking that we saw with matias almeida in 2019 and 2020 they're they've shifted to more of a zonal look and it changes at times. I mean, we've seen um, Alanis come out and mark people further. We've seen Nathan ch chase guys around, but it seems like they're waiting till there's a certain depth on the field before they're gonna make their marks. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just interesting because it was like, well, that's that's a, p a point of strength versatility, which is at a premium in the Matias Almeida system, which you just gave up. But at the same time, like I said, it's a good, it's a good return, but also, you know, he was a great, fiery character out there. What's interesting, though, is that Nathan has a lot of those same attributes and characteristics. Right. And watching him out there, I was my reaction was kind of like, wow, this reminds me a lot of Florian Youngworth out there. So maybe having that fiery type of guy who's a lot more emotional, which you don't get from all on East or Tanner Beeson, is, uh, is interesting to see. And that he can kind of take up that mantle um, that maybe Florian Youngworth was kind of holding on to before. Let's go ahead and get into the, the Nathan question. It, it feels like this was basically almost like Jesse Fiorinelli's last gift to the team mm -hmm. was probably orchestrating the Nathan deal. Since he's been playing, the Quakes have not lost in games that he started. So yeah. he was sitting on the bench for the last loss against the LA Galaxy at home, which was uninspiring, very disappointing. Um, but, uh, but he didn't actually see time in that game. And then immediately... Uh, after that, he started every single game, five draws and a win on the road against the Seattle Sounders. Um, he is, he does seem to, to have quite a bit of flow in him um, and, and maybe even more, more outwardly, uh, you know, ex expre expression, uh, uh, he expresses himself more outwardly, I would say, even than, than floated at times yeah. 
he just goes into a simple tackle and he's like the most excited guy in the world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so how do you think like him being back there has really helped change the fortunes of this team in, in the short term? Well, it, it doesn't surprise me that the team has improved since he's come back there and been on that back line because I mean, that was ostensibly what he was brought in to do. You have to counter that though with the fact that that was when they were starting to make that shift to the three center back rotation which they had flirted with at other times uh but that was kind of when they made the sudden shift so they've got him playing along that back line and you've got all in east in the middle and Beeson on the left and there's been kind of a rotation as to who the wing backs or the full backs however you want to classify it in this system so i think that going to a three center back formation was going to help the defense regardless But at the same time, it also, when you have two more experienced defenders on the center and in the right, it makes up for maybe some of the experience that you have with Tanner Beeson on the left. But what's interesting with Tanner Beeson is even though he is not as experienced, he has very much a ball hawkish mentality. I mean, we remember plays this year and last year where he's been at the right place at the right time. And just, you know, whether he made clearances off the line, as he had in that game earlier this year, he had known goal. It was kind of a tale of two halves for him. But he, even though he doesn't have the same amount of experience, he often is in the right place at the right time. So it's interesting to watch that. The other thing you see with the three-man back line is they're all relatively taller. Much taller than what we saw previously. And that's not that Gurum Kashi and Flor Youngberth were short or anything like that. But there's just more size on the back line now, which was a big problem last year towards the end with all the set piece goals. You look at that playoff game against Sporting Kansas City, um, and you can tell, like, there's not a lot of size out there. You know, Wando and Alanis were the two tallest guys out there. So that was something that you would pay attention to. So Nathan being good, he's looked quality since he's been here. A three-man back line, that may be covering up more of Beeson's deficiencies and highlighting his strengths. And Beeson is getting better, don't get me wrong. It's just you have to take in his lack of experience. I think all three of those things kind of play into each other of, of what's going on right now with that back line. And it's working. They're not bleeding goals. I mean, we all remember that game against Sporting Kansas City at home, LA at home, on the road against a Orlando City. And that was when Daryl DK just got back and was on top of the world. And I still think they're listing his weight by about 20 to 30 <laughs> pounds less than what he ab- actually weighs because he's a monster. And uh, I, you know, I, I have I that same, he, I have that same problem, Ted. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> People just look at us like, oh, you know, you need to add weights. I'm like, oh. uh, but it's it's interesting just to watch these corrections made because the bigger picture though is that it's getting away from what the Matias Almeida earthquakes were in 2019 and parts of 2020 because I think he saw that he needed to adjust that his system w- with the players he had was not yielding the results that were needed, and I think that's. That's good. I mean, that coaches, when they're at their best, maximize their players and put them in positions to succeed. And I think that he probably recognized that some of the talents were not able to do as much of what he wanted them to ask. And because he is a great coach, he said, okay, how can I put these guys in a better position to exceed, succeed? And we've seen those defensive adjustments. The problem has been the offense. Right. I mean, you have Cade Cowell, who is and listen, I think the, the sky is the limit for Cade Cowell, but when you have a guy that's not even 18 years old yet, he's already got four goals and four assists, you can only expect so much. I think Christian Espinosa in the last two games has looked much more like himself, which is going to help. And I think that, you know, you've been asking Shea Salinas to do a million things. You've had the injuries to Benji Gakanovich when it looked like he came in and could be a contributor. Um, you know, Chofi scores these wonder goals, but it's not like it's something you can – plan on you know like you you know that if you get a low cross in and you have wando there he'll bury it that's just something that's something that you can count on but like the the goals that show has scored three out of the four being these left-footed wonders from distance that you know that's not i mean it is by design because he's capable of it but i wouldn't say it's what you're counting on so you need reliable offense to counter what's going on here and that's what's going to take the earthquakes uh, another step forward because they've quieted down the defense. The back line's more secure. You can tell they're a little bit more confident, but simultaneously the offense is really, you know, backtracked and not doesn't look anything like what we saw in 2019 in the parts of 2020. It does feel like, to your point about the offense, it does feel like maybe the uh, the picking up a Bobasi is going to push Kate Cowell back out to the wing. And, you know, the casualty there probably is Shea Salinas, who's been getting a lot of starts. 
he's done a great job filling in, in in this type of situation. But if you want to get Cade Cowell that time on the wing and you want to keep Christian Espinoza on the field, it really feels like you have to be able to have that reliable pressing starting nine who can give you the tax, tactical flexibility that yeah. you need. And, and at this point in his career, Chris Wondolowski is really no longer that. You mentioned Danny Houston. I think that's a really you know, great comparison in terms of, of the type of player that they're probably looking for, but they probably would want a better presser out of that. But one of the things that Houston was fantastic at doing was running into space and being able to get balls in behind. And now mm -hmm. he's a threat. And you think about the type of pace that they would have on those front three now, you know, that, that's pretty exciting to think about for sure. Yeah. And I also look at the fact that, you know, Shea Salinas is very, very effective off the bench. He has shown at various points that, you know, he's so fast and he's such in good shape that he's going to come on and just be a stud as a super sub. So, you know, not that Shea Salinas isn't great as a starter, but he also has that capability as, as a guy coming off the bench with Wando, if you the other thing that he that's been a problem this year is when he's been out there it's like they just sit guys around him he doesn't have any space to make anything happen so if you can have more problems out there cowl on the wing bobacy up top have a uh, christian espinosa on the wing get wando out there as well maybe there's less pressure on him and then also if espinosa is starting to look more like himself maybe you will see a few more of these low crosses that wando can take advantage of because that that type of ball hasn't been there very often and he got one of those two games ago and buried it on a classic one-touch Wando goal, but then they disallowed it because Rios had stepped out of play before – or let the ball get out of play before he brought it back in, which was unfortunate. So, you know, I still think it's there for Wando. We just got to have the ability to get those balls into him. So let's circle back to the Chris Leach question, Ted, because, you know, this, this these were two – you know, sizable moves. You're moving out a player who's been a staple of this team now for several years, as well as bringing in someone who is not yet proven, um, you know, as, as the player, but certainly has that high potential. It does feel like a bit of a, a big swing from Chris Leach. And, and as you mentioned, it, it just, it does come across as this feeling of this is his way of trying to show that he can actually do the job, you know, of, of the general manager. If you just think about the position of general manager, and like you said, like you, I, I really enjoy Jesse Fiorinelli, particularly when you catch him one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. you know, he's just such a great person uh, to talk to. And I think he had a lot of great qualities. In fact, I, th I think he had a lot of great qualities that were underused by the club, like his ability just to speak multiple languages and communicate. I would like to see him in front of a camera a lot more and be an, an ambassador in the area into different communities because he, I thought he had that ability that was never used. And that's just kind of my impression of what was kind of like lacking from the GM position. Like I wanted to see more of that, uh, me personally. And, and I've written at length about this on Quake's Epicenter. But for you, what is it that, regardless if it's Chris Leach or it's it's somebody else that that is selected, what is it that you really kind of want to see you know, happen or change or improve coming out of that particular, you know, office? And, and do you think this is going to be someone who kind of steps up into this greater chief soccer officer role, lacking a president in the club right now? Or are we just going to see more of these type of top level executives that'll, that'll take on these roles? Yeah, I saw that term cited, the chief soccer officer or chief soccer operating officer. I don't remember the exact terminology that was used. Um, but you know, I think that in terms of the priorities is you want someone just in terms of the first team who's going to be able to bring in talent that is going to immediately make an impact and is going to be able to contribute and is going to be able to do things, um, you know, that help the team win. And I thought that, you know, Jesse's initial moves, I mean, Florian Youngworth, Jameer Hika, Danny Hooson, they all came in and made an impact right off the start in 2017. And then you had the acquisition of Vaco. I mean, he scored in his first appearance uh, in New York, and then he scored a huge goal um, against the Whitecaps in the second to last game of the year that put them in great position against uh, Minnesota in the final game of the year. And you had, you know, those guys came in and made impacts. And then, you know, there was Joel Queberg, who was not the, the greatest player, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, I, I understood why, you know, you think you have a good value guy. You can maybe come in and contribute. But Vaco was a good signing. I thought Gurum Kashi was a good signing. I think that, 
you know, it's been more hit or miss. Carlos Fierro, when he's been healthy um, since about the halfway point of 2020, has been pretty good. He just hasn't been healthy. He's right. had some big, big, some big plays. It's just unfortunate he hasn't been out there. Andy Rios hasn't been consistent. He's had some big goals. Think of that back heel goal uh, against Vancouver at the MLS's back. But it just hasn't been consistent. So I think what you need is got our guys that can be very consistent. And also another guy, Christian Espinosa. Uh, you know, I don't think there was any Almeida connection there. I think that was just a guy that Jesse was was uh, scouting, and he turned into a player. And so, you know, I, I think that you want more of those type of players that can always come in and be consistent contributors. And I think that's got to be the, the priority. Um, but I think there's been a weird – view of some of the talents that Jesse brought in. Like people don't realize that, that those players like Danny Houston, when he was healthy, he was a double digit goal scorer in 2018 and had right. some big goals in 2017. And, you know, Jameer Hika, Florian Younger, these guys were contributors. There's, there's a, a weird viewpoint that's been put on those guys. And also Magnus Erickson was another guy who was polarizing among Quakes fans. And I didn't understand why. And I hope that they see, you know, a year and a half later that since he's left the team, they've not been the same on offense that even though he wasn't the paciest guy, he, controlled things well in that, you know, center attacking mid position and made forward advancing passes successfully. Um, but, you know, I think the consistency with the talent and also, I don't know if it's necessarily not getting foreign guys, cause I don't, guys can come from anywhere. If they want to come in and win whatever, but it's there, it delays things when you're having to deal with citizenship issues, green cards, stuff like that, it delays it. And, you know, Judson this year, he was away getting his green card and wasn't there in the preseason. And I think that, you know, only in the last few games has Judson looked like Judson that we remember. And I think those are types of the issues of why Chris Leach, you know, is looking at these guys who can come in and be out there immediately and not have the delays. Um, because, you know, listen, I, you know, I, I believe one of the things that makes, you know, soccer the beautiful game is that you get these people from all over the world playing together. And I think that's one of Major League Soccer's greatest selling points is when you look out on a field, there's the world in front of you. Your fan base is, you know, there's people who, you know, I know there are people in the Bay Area that have Georgian roots. I'm sure being able to watch Vako and Gurm Kashia meant something to them. Just as, as, as the, uh, you know, as any team, when you have something that any type of selling point can be a selling point. But I also do think that if you can get guys – who do not have any of the tie-ups with the P1 visas or the green cards or any of that, um, that's not a bad thing either. But to the greater point, it's just the, the GM has to be able to make impactful signings that come in and contribute. And I think that, you know, maybe one of the reasons there wasn't more of a desire to get a top tier striker is you have had Wando. And I think last year, even if this that's a 34 game season, he probably has double digit goals yet again. Right. Um, but the injuries added up with Hoosen. I think you probably expected more of a finishing touch from Christian Espinosa. Um, and, you know, Wando still does his thing. So you look at all those things and you say, okay, Wando's not going to go forever. I mean, he's given Father Time a run for his money, but it eventually it will force him out. You have the, the, the GM has to be able to sign those guys that can come in and be the consistent double digit goal scorers. And Christian Espinosa, I mean, he's been a very, very consistent player. 13 assists in a 34-game season in 2019. Nine last year in a shortened season. And I think that if he catches fire here at the end, which is certainly possible, you know, that could turn into that. You need more guys like Christian Espinosa. You hope that Nabobasi would be assigning just like that. You hope that, you know, these other guys that would be able to come in and be contributors, consistent contributors. And that I am consistently coming back to consistent contributor because that's the one thing I keep on coming back to is you need more of those guys that can be, you know, just game in, game out, reliable. And that to me is paramount. When you start talking about beyond that and looking at the academy and looking at the other different structures, of, I mean, that's, that's a big or broader destruction, uh, discussion that would take a lot, um, too much time <laughs> to get into. But when I'm talking about the first team, it's got to be the acquisition of immediate impact players. You and I could start our own podcast on these other topics, I'm sure. I'm sure, I'm sure we could go on. People would tune in for <laughs> six hours of us talking about, you know, Santa Clara County and meetings. You know, it would it would go on and on and on. We would enjoy it. I don't know if everybody else would enjoy it, but. <laughs> Potentially not. Um, and you mentioned the foreign players. 
You know, one of the things that's really interesting to me is I think very quietly, the Quakes are building a base of young American players or players who, you know, are going to be, you know, permanent citizens, you know, here and, and just the signing of a Bobasi. Now you've got, you know, JT Marcinkowski, you've got Tanner Beeson, uh, you've, you've got uh, Jackson Ewell, you've, you know, so you're really now seeing the Quakes, I believe, start to build that. And there's players that we aren't seeing as much of like a Jack Scahan uh, and uh, Eric Cavio, who has been loaned out uh, to, yeah. to Orange County, but can be recalled at any time. I think a lot of people are concerned that he's gone and he can't help, but certainly if he's needed, Matias Almeida can, can call him back to your, I think your earlier point about, about depth at, the, at that center mid position. So um, I think it feels like very quietly that base is starting to be created. And, and now Jeremy Abobasi as a, uh, you know, a U.S. Uh, men's national team uh, prospect, you know, fills another uh, spot of American players that the team yeah. is, is beginning to rely more and more on. Let's talk real quick about uh, the, 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 uh, the playoffs. The, the Quakes, as it sits, are, you know, a little bit more than, than a win out of the playoff position at this point. Do you feel that the moves that have been made, you know, the Nathan, the Nathan signing, the Abobasi signing, um, you know, obviously had to trade, trade away uh, uh, Florian Youngworth in order to get some of the gam back that, uh, that was spent on the Abobasi trade. But do you feel that this team is now set up with a good possibility of finding a way to get into, you know, one of the last two or three playoff spots? Yeah, and I know that some people might say that's wishful thinking, but I think that part part of the problem this year has been that you to have a dream season, you need guys to play to their ceiling. You need, you know, Wando to be Wando. You need Cade Cowell to be all of his potential, Espinosa to be all of his potential, uh, Chofis to all of his potential. You go down the list, you talk player after player after player. I think that, you know, if you look at earlier in this year, you know, I think maybe Jackson Ewell's maybe a little bit of tired from doing all the national team stuff, and he hadn't been quite up to his normal level. Christian Espinosa had not been up to his level. Um, you know, I think that you had guys that weren't playing up to their capabilities, and I'm not not blaming them for anything on that. I mean, I just think that was the reality, is guys were not playing to their ultimate capability uh, of, of excellence. And I think that the earthquakes are due for a correction in that, and I think we've seen it with Christian Espinosa in the last couple of games. I think he's starting to look much more like his usual self. Um, and I think that with the acquisition of Abobasi and with Nathan and the newer formations that they're using to try and maximize their defensive abilities, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're only a few points out, a handful of points. There's no reason why this can't change over the next 16 games. And the fact that the Earthquakes, and this is what I was talking about in, in my post game on uh, Wednesday night, if the Earthquakes had gotten all these road draws in 2019, there's a good chance they make it into the playoffs. They didn't get these road points previously or games where they were in a position to get a point on the road. They didn't. And I think that if we had gone back to that point, we probably all said, oh, if they had only been able to get a point in Atlanta or if they'd only been able to get a point in NYCFC or you, you go down the list, that didn't happen. This year, it feels like they are earning those points on the road. And hopefully if they can start winning at home with the acquisition of a Boba C and Nathan kind of making things more solid along the back line, that you will be able to rack up those points at home. Because if you, if you win at home and you get points on the road, that's a recipe for getting into the playoffs. And I feel like we're doing one half of that. The harder part, the getting the, the points on the road, now it's time for this team to win at home, something they haven't done you know, since the start of May, it's been a while. So if they can get those road wins and keep on getting, you know, earning road draws, they're, they'll climb up the standings. And they've got three in a row at home now. And it's a perfect opportunity for them to do so before they go back out onto the road and take on the Galaxy. And hopefully if they're, you know, continuing this run of improved form, they'll be able to get a little bit of revenge uh, for what happened here on the 26th of June. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Ted. And this has been great. You and I don't usually get a chance to catch up in a, in a longer form like this. And, and it's been uh, fantastic for me to play host and to have you as a guest and uh, the shoes on the other foot. I'm certainly not the host that you are. 
but I've really enjoyed getting uh, getting your uh, perspectives on uh, some of the latest things going around the San Jose earthquakes. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, talking with you again in the near future. Yeah, man. No, don't 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 knock yourself down. You do a great job hosting, and uh, you got me talking. So uh, you know, I apologize for taking up too much of your time. As I as I you know, I do get going, but yeah, man. I you know, I think there's there's reason to be hopeful right now. I think you know, a couple of weeks ago it was a little bit more of a negative feeling around the quakes, but now it feels like things are taking positive steps, and I'm excited to see where this goes. And uh, yeah, you know, now. Uh, uh, we can keep on doing the exchange. Uh, I was on yours. Now you can come back on mine. We can do this again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's uh, I'm just looking forward to when I'm traveling again so that uh, when I'm up in Seattle, like in a normal year, I would have been able to see you on Wednesday night. Uh, but uh, I, uh, you know, well, who knows when society will turn to normal? That's another seven or eight hour podcast. Yes. We we, 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 let's not even bring in the COVID topic. We yes. could be here for much, much longer. Well, Ted, again, thank you so much. For joining us today and we'll look forward to your broadcast of LAFC uh, coming up this weekend. Take care. Peace. Go Quakes.